Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much to Jamila and the Friends of Parkinson's for the invitation uh, to speak with you this morning. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm actually in Greensboro, Alabama, visiting uh, my brother, who's a psychiatrist, chronically mentally ill in rural Alabama. This morning, I want to talk to you about an important topic, and that's one that's near and dear to all of our hearts, and that's ending Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is now the world's fastest growing brain disorder in the world. It's faster growing than Alzheimer's disease. Uh, as everyone in this room knows, it's a debilitating condition. And a lot of time and effort has been devoted to treat the disease or trying to cure it. I'm going to focus today's talk on how we can end the disease, how we can get rid of this disease that was first described essentially 200 years ago and put it like polio into the span of diseases which no longer plague uh, humans. I'm going to do that by talking to you first about the age of degenerative and man-made diseases in which we live in today. Second, talk about the rise of Parkinson's disease. And then third, conclude with how we can end, end this disease and talk about our book that uh, is written for people like you. It's coming out March 17th. It describes everything that I'm going over today in greater detail, including what are the new treatments available to treat the disease? Uh, next slide, Eric. And the next slide. So R Rene Dubois was a, as a, was a French scientist and an early environmentalist. And he said, every civilization has its own kind of pestilence and can control, its, can control it only by reforming itself. And translated into modern English, every society creates its own diseases. And we clearly have diseases that we created ourselves, among them, for example, our car accidents. But for our uh, uh, affection for cars, no one would die in car accidents. Another clearly man-made disease is, next slide, uh, on the next slide, Eric, is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, is, uh, so this is what he said, um, we live in this age of degenerative man-made diseases. This is an epidemiologist, Abdul Omran, who wrote a very influential paper 50 years ago. And he said, early humans uh, died from pestilence and famine. We died essentially because we didn't have enough food to feed ourselves. And then after the agrarian revolution 10,000 years ago, we, we died chiefly from pandemics. So the bubonic plague in the 1500s, the influenza pandemic in 1918, all killed 50 million, 500 million uh, individuals and was a major source of death. And now we live in the age of degenerative and man-made diseases. In the future, uh, we're going to have delayed degenerative diseases and emerging infections. And a great example of that uh, emerging infection would be the coronavirus. But the chief challenge of our time is coronaviruses, although that's on the front page of the news all the time, but Parkinson's disease, which for some reason is never spoken about, even though it's now the 14th leading cause of death in the United States. And our time risk of developing disease is up to one in 15, one in 15. So Eric's lifetime risk, my lifetime risk of developing disease for which we have devoted our careers to caring for is one in 15. By comparison, our likelihood of dying in a car accident is one in 100. You can think about how much time and effort we put into wearing seatbelts, airbags, and driving safe cars, when, but how little time and attention we devote to preventing Parkinson's disease. Next slide. The classic example of a man-made disease is lung cancer. So lung cancer before the introduction of cigarettes in the late 1800s was considered a once in a lifetime oddity. When doctors saw a case of lung cancer, they gathered all the medical students around and even their colleagues because they thought they would never see a case. And as you can see with that black line, is that lung cancer deaths in the United States in the 1920s were almost negligible, never seen. Uh, but unfortunately, cigarettes were introduced in the late 1800s, first in England and then eventually in the U.S., and they quickly rose to prominence. And 25 years after the introduction of cigarettes, you can see a corresponding, almost perfect, a corresponding rise in lung cancer deaths. Fortunately, cigarettes uh, are on the decline, especially in, in the West, in places like Las Vegas, um, and you can see lung cancer deaths have also uh, declined again with the 25-year lag. Next slide. So this takes us to discussing Parkinson's disease. So next slide. 
Parkinson's, not surprisingly, was described by Dr. James Parkinson in 1817 in London. Uh, he was a 61-year-old physician at the time, and he was observing something new and novel on the streets of London. Tremor had long been described, and Shakespeare, in fact, had even described an individual with tremor, but Parkinson's disease, this disorder that had a rest tremor, a pill rolling tremor, a stoop posture, a shuffling gait, and a tendency to fall, had not been described. And uh, Dr. Parkinson even said, I'm describing something that has escaped the classification of our times. And what's going on in London in 1817 is on the next slide, is the Industrial Revolution, uh, which was started in England and was uh, uh, very present in London. And numerous products and byproducts of the Industrial Revolution have been linked to Parkinson's disease. And among them is air pollution. So the London fog had little to do with weather and almost everything to do with air pollution. The London fog, as you can see on that picture, was so dense and so thick that you couldn't see across the street. You had the boys using torches uh, to light the way for pedestrians and carriages to go on the streets of London. You can also see the lady and the man and even the, their child are covering their mouths uh, to avoid the harmful effects of air pollution. If you think about uh, a modern day picture of this could be Beijing uh, today in 2020. And so uh, Parkinson's disease, which uh, was only rarely, rarely described in ancient Greek, uh, Indian, and Chinese texts before this time had now been introduced into England. Next slide. And now, uh, 200 years later, Parkinson's disease is the fastest growing brain disease in the world. It's faster growing than Alzheimer's disease. The number of people affected by the disease globally has more than doubled over the last 25 years. And if we do nothing, if our generation does not act, the number of people will double again to uh, nearly 13 million people. One million Americans now have this disease, and we need to do something about it to bring about its end. Next slide. And so factors that have been associated with uh, Parkinson's disease are air pollution. And if you look at this graph, uh, and you look at the graph of deaths due to Parkinson's disease, it's almost a perfect uh, correlation, again, with a lag time of you know, 20 to 30 or 40 years. You can see that air pollution was first uh, prominent in uh, Europe in the, 19, in the 19th century, and then was introduced into North America, and then introduced into Asia. And if you look at maps of Parkinson's disease, the rates of the disease are highest in the industrialized world, such as the United States and Western Europe, lowest in the least industrialized parts of the world, like Africa, and growing the most rapidly in the most rapidly industrializing parts of the world, like Southeast Asia. You also uh, likely know that Parkinson's disease, one of the first symptoms of Parkinson's disease is loss of smell. Um, many of you in the room have probably lost your sense of smell years, if not decades, uh, before you develop uh, the tremor uh, that is commonly associated with Parkinson's disease. Next slide. Air pollution is not the only industrial uh, product or byproduct that's been associated with Parkinson's disease. Uh, pesticides, both naturally occurring and synthetic ones, certain ones, are associated with the disease. Uh, pesticides, as some of you may know, are nothing more than nerve toxins. Many of them are fat soluble, which means that they readily dissolve and enter the brain, and they attack the energy producing parts of cells that are implicated in Parkinson's disease. And uh, while naturally occurring pesticides have been along for, uh, meant for years since the advent of uh, some of the plants that, and insects that produce them, uh, synthetic pesticides were introduced after World War II, and you can see that their rise has been uh, linear uh, since that time. And uh, pesticides can, are also inhaled by farmers who uh, work with them, and farmers are at 50 to 200 percent increased risk of developing the disease. And pesticides also may enter us through the gut, and as some of you uh, know, constipation is an early symptom of Parkinson's disease, often beginning years, if not decades before the onset of tremor associated with the condition. Next slide. Uh, so over 20 studies, and it's more, more than that, on new, by numerous investigators on numerous continents, have pesticides to, uh, to Parkinson's disease. 
especially a troubling uh, pesticide is called Paraquat. It's been called the most toxic herbicide uh, created by humans. It kills the weeds that round up can't. It's been bound, banned by 32 countries, including China, uh, United Arab Emirates, and Syria. Uh, however, in the United States, we haven't banned it. In fact, our use of the pesticide has doubled in the uh, last decade. And while it doesn't appear to be a major uh, impact uh, in Nevada, you can see that large portions of the world, including where I, I'm sitting today and where I live in Rochester, New York, are uh, covered uh, with Paraquat. Next slide. Paraquat and pesticides are not the only envi environmental factor. So in addition to air pollution and pesticides, another chemical called trichloroethylene uh, associated with Parkinson's disease. Trichloroethylene is a liquid, it's a solvent uh, that's been used in everything from degreasing, so mechanics use it uh, commonly, cleaning silicon wafers, uh, used in dry cleaning, and we'll talk a lot about that, and used in as late as the 1970s to decaffeinate coffee. It was even used as an anesthetic, uh, especially for pregnancy, uh, until I think the 1970s when the FDA banned it due to safety concerns. It's now found in half of Superfund sites throughout the United States. Fortunately, you in Nevada are free from these Superfund sites that are contaminated with trichloroethylene. But trichloroethylene is found in thousands of uh, other contaminated sites throughout the United States. I found one in the process of writing the book, 15 Minutes from My Home. And more recently, we're investigating a cluster of individuals who worked in a building in downtown Rochester that might have been contaminated with trichloroethylene and it's a closely related compound called perchloroethylene. Next slide. And this is uh, Danny Fromm with the orange hat and the Team Fox t-shirt. And in the 1980s, uh, he worked in the aerospace industry in Southern California. And his friend, uh, after graduating high school, got a job at one of these uh, tech companies and uh, was able to finagle him a job as well. And his job was pouring trichloroethylene on circuit boards to clean them, uh, free, to free them from solder and other uh, contaminants that were on the circuit board so they could be used in the aerospace industry. And he recalled the sweet smell of this uh, chemical and always felt uneasy using it because he never used any protection. He worked uh, with the chemical for about eight years and 10 years uh, after he stopped working, his pinky uh, began twitching. Um, and since that time, uh, he's had uh, 10 years of progressive Parkinson's disease. Had, I think he's had deep brain stimulation and now lives in Idaho with his family. But he says in the book, was we profile it, if you work with this chemical, you should get as far away from it as possible. Now, there's no clear way of us uh, right now of assessing whether his Parkinson's disease is due to this chemical, but his story is not unique and is increasingly common as I've spoken to people around the country, maybe people in the audience will tell me their stories as well. Next slide. So we wanted to get a local story for you in Las Vegas, and it turns out that we found with uh, relatively little effort a, a plume or a collection of perchloroethylene, a chemical widely used in dry cleaning, very closely related to trichloroethylene. For the scientists in the room, all it does is has one extra chlorine on it. And it's found in the groundwater near Maryland Square Shopping Center. I'm not sure exactly where Maryland Square Shopping Center is in Las Vegas, but I'm hoping you in the room will know where it is. And what happens often from these sites are often from uh, either dry cleaners or industrial sites or often Department of Defense sites. And the chemicals are inappropriately often poured into the ground or uh, into leaky barrels and then leak and spread in uh, affecting not only the area where the contamination occurred, but it can move miles, as you can see, and affects homes, residences, and other office buildings. Next slide. And so this is how, uh, it's just a graphic uh, from a report from the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection that shows uh, a spill of perchloroethylene, abbreviated PCE, uh, that gets into the dry, dry soil and then penetrates deeper into the groundwater and saturated soil. And because this chemical, both perchloroethylene and trichloroethylene, readily evaporate, uh, those vapors enter into either buildings, office buildings like shopping malls or residential neighborhoods or even golf courses, 
and are inhaled by uh, individuals living or working in those uh, situations without warning. It's very much like uh, individuals are probably familiar with radon, which evaporates from the soil and can be readily uh, uh, enter into people's homes and causes lung cancer. Uh, PCE also, or TCE also causes cancer, but it also can cause uh, Parkinson's disease. The good news is if you build a new construction, all you have to do is put a vapor barrier that prevents the vapors from entering the building. And even if you already have an existing construction and you have contamination of your air, it's relatively easy to uh, remove that contamination by just putting a pipe underneath the uh, sub-basement and having that pipe uh, take out air and have it emitted above your house. Next slide. So this is Jane Horton. Uh, she lives in Silicon Valley. It turns out she lives across the street from the headquarters of Google. And the headquarters of Google are built on a Superfund site uh, that was due to contamination with uh, TCE uh, from Intel Corporation and Fairchild Semiconductor, which used it in the production of silicon wafers. She heard about the contamination, had her air in her home tested, and uh, her hair, air levels were contaminated with levels far above the EPA thresholds. And so she had, in her words, her house cut, butchered, and vented, and had a trichloroethylene remediation system put in. It's right below the electronic meters uh, in the picture. And it takes nothing more, but it sucks out air from underneath her house and pipes it out above her house. So she now says she has the cleanest air in Mountain View, California. It turns out that six people who live on the street near where she does, right near uh, Google's current headquarters, developed Parkinson's disease, and four developed brain tumors. Uh, next slide. And in addition to these environmental factors, people are living longer. So we know that Parkinson's disease takes years, if not decades, to develop. This is a paper from uh, researchers at uh, researchers who published a paper in JAMA Neurology two years ago and showed that uh, the loss of smell, and osmia is a fancy medical term for, the, for loss of smell, can begin 45 years before uh, the motor symptoms of Parkinson's like tremor and slowness of movement. Constipation begins early, uh, sleep disorders, anxiety, memory loss, uh, depression are all early symptoms of the disease that begin far in advance of the motor manifestations of the disease, which are actually more likely a mid-stage uh, expression of the disease that begins in the nose, uh, especially in the nose and in the gut. We live longer, more and more of us will uh, uh, allow time for, this, uh, for the effects, in some cases toxic effects of environmental exposures to manifest themselves uh, in us as we enter retirement and beyond. Next slide. So how can we uh, end Parkinson's disease? Is there any hope? And there is considerable hope. Uh, next slide. Because to the extent that Parkinson's disease is man-made and we're not certain whether it is, we need more research to determine whether it is. But certainly to the extent that Parkinson's disease is linked to products and byproducts of human behavior, it can be human-ended. And it's about the only place in the world that's been shown to have a decreasing rates of Parkinson's disease is the Netherlands. And the Netherlands air pollution uh, decreased by more than 50% between 1990 and 2012. Uh, pesticides, which are fat soluble and can be tested in uh, fatty tissues, between 1968 and 1986, levels of pesticides, including DDT and other uh, even more harmful pesticides in terms of Parkinson's disease, decreased between 75 and 90%. And trichloroethylene, which I told you was ubiquitous in the 1970s in the United States. In 1981, the levels of uh, airborne levels of trichloroethylene in the Netherlands were among the lowest in all of Europe. And not surprisingly to me, but at least one association is that uh, Parkinson's disease rates of Parkinson's disease decreased by about half in the Netherlands between 1990 and 2000. Now, I can't say for certain whether these factors diminish air pollution, decreased use of uh, pesticides, and decreased use of trichloroethylene contributed to it, but it certainly is a hopeful sign that if we change our behaviors, if we get rid of pesticides that are linked to Parkinson's disease, if we improve the quality of our air and decontaminate and prevent the effects of these uh, chemicals like trichloroethylene and percholethylene, we can prevent people from ever developing the disease in the first place. 
Next slide. And so there are lots of things that we can do to end Parkinson's disease. In our book, we identify a prescription for action to do it. Uh, one is to first to prevent the disease. Second is to advocate for additional resources and policies. Three is to care for anyone affected. And four is to treat the condition with uh, novel therapies. And we call this a PACT, P-A-C-T, that we as a community can take to address one of the great global health challenges of our time. In, uh, for prevention, we can ban paraquat and trichloroethylene. Other countries have done so with good consequences and without any or negative consequences. As many of you know, exercise helps people with Parkinson's disease and exercising in your 40s and 50s can decrease your risk of Parkinson's disease in subsequent decades by about 20%. A Mediterranean diet has also been shown to uh, decrease the risk of developing Parkinson's disease, as have been modest amounts of caffeine. Uh, similarly, decreasing your risk of head trauma by wearing a helmet can also help decrease your risk of Parkinson's disease. On the advocacy front, we need to clearly push for greater research funding. And I, at the same time, the number of individuals with Parkinson's disease in the U.S. has increased by at least 35%. And NIH funding for the condition adjusted for inflation has actually decreased. You can also uh, support additional research efforts, and many of you are, and we're very thankful for that. And share your stories uh, about uh, your story with Parkinson's disease and how you think you might have been uh, developed the condition, because those stories are very powerful and change the behavior of representatives. Third, we need to care for everyone with the condition. Uh, as some of you know, I see all my patients over the internet. We see them in their homes. It's kind of odd that we ask patients with uh, immobility and impaired driving ability to drive to urban centers uh, to, to receive care. We think care should be brought to you on your terms, and we do that uh, by uh, bringing care via telemedicine. Unfortunately, Medicare doesn't cover telemedicine when providing the home, which leaves many people with limited access to care. And finally, we need to treat the condition. Many of you uh, participate in research studies, uh, and now you can participate in research studies like Fox Insight without ever leaving your home. Genetic factors clearly are important in, in, and are known to interact with many of these environmental factors, especially pesticides, and can heighten people's risk of developing uh, Parkinson's disease. And now we have a new generation of gene-directed therapies coming down the pipe and could be helpful not only for those who carry the genetic mutations, but for those who uh, have Parkinson's disease in general. The next slide. And so our, our book is coming out March 17, 2020. I'm going to give you a, a shameless plug for the book for the last minute. If you like any of these stories, if you think this is an important effort, we need your help uh, in increasing awareness of the disease. You know, Alzheimer's disease is sometimes talked about, coronavirus is rightfully talked about, but no one talks about Parkinson's disease. And we have seen in the history of the people in this room that we've changed the course of diseases. We have ended and nearly ended diseases. In the 1950s, a group of uh, dedicated advocates led by the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, began a march of dimes to end polio. In the 19, late uh, 1940s and early 1950s, people sent, mailed in dimes to their White House, into the White House, nearly shut down the White House post office, raised millions of dollars for the condition, funded the efforts of Albert Sabin and Jonas Salk, and developed vaccines. And now none of us worry about developing polio because it's been eradicated not only from the US, but from almost nearly every part of the world. In the 1980s, uh, unknown condition that was uniformly fatal was identified in homosexual men in the United States. In 1981, it was reported a rare tumor called Kaposi sarcoma was developing among homosexual men. At that time, HIV was unknown. AIDS was uniformly and rapidly fatal. And the federal response and societal response was either ignorance, discrimination, or blaming the victims of the disease. A group of activists, HIV activists, grew out of that, uh, out of necessity, adopted a motto that said that silence equals death, and refused to uh, refuse uh, and organize themselves and combated uh, actually one of the greatest uh, health challenges of our time. Uh, Fifteen years later, they had uh, developed 
ACE inhibitors, which allow people with HIV to live near normal life expectancies. Today, more people, a greater proportion of people with HIV are, receive appropriate treatment for their condition than people with Parkinson's disease. Thousands, if not millions of us don't have HIV because of their act actions and efforts to prevent transmission of the disease. In this century, we've seen a group of women uh, who grew frustrated and upset with the inability and lack of response to preventing breast cancer. Out of that grew first peach ribbons and then pink ribbons, and then walks throughout society and have improved the rates of diagnosis of uh, breast cancer and improved survival. We need to do the same thing for Parkinson's disease. Uh, in this book, which is written by my colleagues, Todd Scher, the CEO of the Michael J. Fox Foundation, Michael Oaken, a Parkinson's specialist at the University of Florida, and Boston Bloom, a Parkinson's specialist, and the Netherlands have identified a prescription for action that we can do for our community to prevent, advocate, care, and treat the condition with new therapies. All of our proceeds that uh, are devote that were coming from the book um, for the authors are being devoted to efforts to help end Parkinson's disease. The more attention, the more people buy the book, the more people read the book, the more people share the book, the more people tweet about the book the sooner we will come to the day where we can end this disease and that future generations can look back on ours, like we look those back on HIV activists and those individuals who donate their dimes and be thankful for us for helping eradicate a disease, ending a disease that we need not deal with anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. That was great. Um, you couldn't see the people, but they were all very spellbound. I was watching them. So enjoy your vacation. I'm happy to take any questions if you guys oh. have any questions or if you have oh. time for questions. Oh, okay. Anybody have any questions? Hold on. What about, what about development on future things for Parkinson? I've got a word, I want a word here and I don't know how to pronounce it, but they say this is done by intravenous fusion. Is that a new thing coming out? Uh, so there are new new drugs in development for Parkinson's disease. Many are, because of our advances in the genetic understanding of the disease, there are certain genes that are implicated in Parkinson's disease, and they are known to interact with some of these environmental factors. And there are gene, drugs, for example, that are being targeted at a gene called LARC2 and a gene called GBA uh, that are promising treatments. There's also, I think it's an IV infusion, a, a drug that targets the misfolded protein that occurs in Parkinson's disease. It's called alpha-synuclein. And there are immune therapies, antibodies that are being uh, developed and tested uh, to treat that condition. And so in the book, in addition to discussing the ways we can prevent the disease, we talk about uh, many of these new therapies that are coming down the pipe uh, to help those who already have the disease. You had mentioned that there was a plume um, when you were able to isolate it underneath the uh, mall um, yeah. downtown. One of the things that we had here in Henderson, literally almost on the ground that we're sitting on, was a rocket fuel plant for a number of years that was producing ammonium perchlorate and utilizing a lot of trichloroethylene. Has anybody looked into that or, or simulated any studies to the incidence of Parkinson's here in the greater Las Vegas Valley or the water tables exchange? Uh, no, but I think you're exactly right that so uh, trichloroethylene was uh, is used widely uh, to flush out rocket engines and clean rocket engines and we're investigating a cluster of people uh, in downtown Rochester who all worked in a building that was right near a dry cleaners. Um, there are you know prominent uh, individuals who are astronauts who have uh, Parkinson's disease in, in the uh, greater Parkinson's community. Uh, I don't know what's going on exactly in Las Vegas at that site, but you're not alone. Uh, as I alluded to that we found one 15 minutes for where I live uh, in suburban Rochester. Uh, I think it's a huge issue and uh, largely been ignored and there's been insufficient research done uh, to identify this and to prevent people from developing the disease. Again, this is to the extent that trichloroethylene causes Parkinson's disease, it's eminently preventable. Will all the information that was on the slides be in the book? 
everything uh, everything I discussed is, is in the book. I didn't I didn't have the Las Vegas slide. That was just for you guys. That was uh, uh, the mall was just for you. But just everything about everything else is in the book and described. In addition, we put down uh, a checklist of, of things that individuals can do to decrease their risk of Parkinson's, to advocate for additional resources, to care for all affected, and to treat. We have a prescription for action that's essentially a checklist. And we have a, a, a pages of additional resources that help people with, with the condition as well. And it's written for the general audience. It's, uh, if you understood what I just said, uh, hopefully I was clear, uh, you'll be able to understand the book. One of our students who's from China said, Parkinson's disease is complicated, the book is simple. <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. It was very, very interesting. Um, we in Las Vegas, in this area, we have our houses sprayed for bugs, for all sorts of critters. What about the uh, pesticides in that? Yeah, so it, certain pesticides are not linked with Parkinson's disease, but certain ones are. There's another one called chlorpyrifos uh, that was widely used and still used to get rid of uh, insects uh, and the like. Uh, a New England Journal of Medicine article estimated that that pesticide caused 15 million children 25 million IQ points. Um, uh, I've become the concerned about the effects of uh, pesticides. I, I think we could all do with more weeds and less pesticides. Not all pesticides are linked to Parkinson's disease, but certain ones are. And all of these, uh, many of these have health consequences. And we really just don't know, uh, for example, you know, you can imagine it's really hard to study effects on home use of pesticides and to follow people for 10 for decades to see who develops Parkinson's disease and those who don't. But we know that some of these pesticides like Paraquat, when you feed them to mice, they develop Parkinson's disease. Thanks. I was employed by IBM for 30 plus years as a technician. And we basically took baths and trichloroethane to fix stuff. And uh, so you may want to review the history on the, the guys that work there because uh, we're all in bad shape. <laughs> um, so we created a, a website called endingpd.org. And I think on that website, you can email us and we want to hear your stories. We want to do research. Um, we're in the planning stages of creating a center at the University of Rochester that would be focused on preventing Parkinson's disease, and we want to hear those stories. Um, so if you give Jamila, uh, or Jamila can give you my email, and if you email me directly, I'd be happy to follow up with you. What was your name? I'm sorry. That's Rex. Rex Kavist. Uh, like I say, I was employed with, and they love that stuff. In fact, they're still using it somewhat in the cleaning fluids that they issue to people. I yes. And say I, I'm his wife and I used to beg him to bring it home because it cleaned everything. <laughs> um, and so in 1932, a doctor, uh, uh, McCord from Chrysler Corporation in Cincinnati, where I grew up, wrote a letter to the, to the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, which is one of our leading medical journals, and said exactly what you said. This is the best industrial solvent ever. But the title of his uh, article, uh, letter to the editor, was The Toxicity of Trichloroethylene. And he said, we put it on the skin of rabbits and they died. We had rabbits inhale it and they died. So before we uh, use this, in, this great industrial solvent, we should be mindful of its harmful and toxic effects. And I don't think we followed his advice from nearly 90 years ago. I have a controversial question. For and forgive me because I have Parkinson's disease, but it appears we've been poisoned by environmental neurotoxin and the medical industry and culture in general rejects that there's a cause. They won't point to a cause, obviously, for liability issues or lawsuits since we're also sue happy. It, it seems that they would be working on an antidote or a way to flush these chemicals out of your brain um, as any poison has a, a way to neutralize it instead of just treating the symptoms. Is, is there any doctors, any, any direction to actually help the patients that have been poisoned with any way to neutralize or flush that, that chemical neurotoxin out of your brain? 
Yeah, so uh, a great question. And there's been such limited research on preventing Parkinson's disease. And even my colleague who did a lot of this research, Dr. Carly Tanner in, in California, said that funding for such research has largely dried up. So we know, for example, pesticides can lead to this misfolded protein called alpha-synuclein. And so one of the treatments that uh, one of the earlier, uh, one of your colleagues had asked before, is using immune therapy to get rid of this misfolded protein. Uh, again, that's treating the disease after the fact. Um, the uh, trichloroethylene is rapidly metabolized, so it uh, clears the body within hours. Uh, I'm learning this stuff. I'm actually new to this uh, myself, and so still learning about it. So it doesn't appear that it is stored in the body and thus can be removed from the body. Um, more ominously, some of these pesticides are dissolved in fat, and so the only way they leave the body is when nursing mothers nurse their children. And then so these pesticides can be found in the breast milk uh, from nursing mothers and then is passed on to their children and likely uh, enters their brains, their children's brains. Um, there have been no like chelation therapies or anything like that have been shown to be effective uh, for Parkinson's disease. And uh, there still needs to be more research linking these uh, environmental factors to it but we don't have the therapies that you're looking for right now. Um, and we should think about those and we should also think about some easy steps we can do to prevent others from ever developing the disease. Any last questions? I think you've answered all the questions, Ray. Everybody, I don't see any hands up, so. Thank you very much. That talk was great, very enlightening, and from a perspective that we don't hear too often. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much, Jamila. And thank you for all your efforts on behalf of the Parkinson's community. We're here to help, and with your help and our collective efforts, we can help bring about the end of this disease.